Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation, uh, particularly to discuss this important topic with a lot of new information uh, becoming available. Uh, uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, as you know, you're seeing a lot more cysts in your practice in uh, probably daily, uh, and the question is what to do with them. Many of these cysts range from benign to locally aggressive or known malignant potential to invasive tumors, and therefore the management is uh, uh, widely variable from no further action to additional follow-up or additional intervention and uh, certainly surgery as well. Unfortunately, we know that overall preoperative diagnostic accuracy is less than 70%. So we're not really good in sending these patients to uh, surgery. Now, just a quick uh, algorithmic approach to the differential diagnosis of cystic pancreatic lesions. Uh, certainly imaging is very important in the differential diagnosis. And we look for ductal communication, best seen on MRI. If you see ductal communication, history becomes important. If there is history of pancreatitis, it's a pseudocyst for the most part no history of pancreatitis, most likely IPMN. Now, if there is no ductal communication, we look for other morphological features, whether it's a unilocular cyst, again, no history of pancreatitis. Uh, if there is history of pancreatitis, it's a pseudocyst. If no history of pancreatitis, we look for another feature, whether there is rim enhancement or not. If there is a rim enhancement, you're dealing with a cystic islet cell tumor. If there is no rim enhancement, it's a mucinous cystic neoplasm. It could certainly be a mucinous cystic neoplasm that is a macrocystic. If it's microcystic, it's a serous cystic neoplasm. Of course, in a young patient, young female with cystic and solid component, think of SPEN. Okay, so this is an overview of pathologic features, MRI features, demographics as well, and looking at the typical features, which I'm not gonna get into, but fluid characteristics can be helpful as well, whether it's high amylase suggesting the presence of acute pancreatitis, no mucin, low viscosity, low CA, and low amylase would favor a serous cyst, the presence of mucin, high viscosity, high CA, and low amylase would favor either a mucinous cystic neoplasm or IPMN. Okay. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think the good is the serous cyst. The bad is going to be some mucin-containing cyst. The ugly hopefully wouldn't kill the patient, but maybe hemorrhagic, maybe with layering, maybe with debris is the pseudocyst. So here is the clinical conundrum. Most common cystic pancreatic lesions, some of them may have atypical features. Less common cystic lesions of the pancreas may be difficult to diagnose, and I'll show you some examples. Many resected lesions are benign, unfortunately, and beware of the peripancreatic lesions that can often be confused as pancreatic lesions. This is more of a straightforward diagnosis by MRI, can be a little bit of a challenge on CT, low attenuation lesion on, um, in, in the pancreas, easy diagnosis in and out of phase with uh, loss of signal in the opposed phase. This is focal fat. This one is a little bit more challenging, and we had an excellent discussion about the role of unenhanced T1. This is a case where it was suspected to be main duct IPMN in the tail of the pancreas, but when you look more carefully, there's pancreatic adenocarcinoma here, resulting in dilatation of the distal uh, portion of the pancreatic duct. So be very careful when you see focally dilated pancreatic duct. This is an 83-year-old uh, male with a question of pancreatic cyst by CT, T2 bright, uh, no enhancement, no septations, no mural nodules, no dilation of the pancreatic duct. This was sent for surgery, and this was a bronchogenic cyst. It doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to encounter some of these lesions. Here's another example. 
incidental finding of a pancreatic cyst and went, uh, a patient underwent workup for cough. This is an exophytic lesion in the tail of the pancreas, slightly bright on T2, no suppression on out of phase, no internal enhancement, again, no septations, no dilated pancreatic duct. Unfortunately, this was a lymphoepithelial cyst. So it can be very challenging when you're dealing with pancreatic slash peripancreatic lesions. Here's another example, patient with nausea and dyspnea. So they're symptomatic. Uh, this is a T2 bright lesion, also T1 bright, so suggesting maybe hemorrhage or protein with some layering. Again, no ductal communication, no internal enhancement, and uh, there's no mural nodules and no dilated pancreatic duct. This was pathologically a foregut cyst. This is a lesion that we had a while back, uh, and uh, we thought we had established communication with the main pancreatic duct. This was, uh, we thought, uh, dealing with an IPMN with ductal communication, only with better sequence development and more 3D acquisitions. It turned out that that ductal communication is actually with the main, with the common duct, with the, not with the main pancreatic duct. So what we've been calling all along IPMN turned out to be a type 2 colodocal cyst. We just never could see the communication well, but now we can. So... What's the value of a multidisciplinary clinic? And as you know, most of the cysts that we see fall in one of these two categories. Either no or low malignant potential, such as pseudocyst or serous cyst, or the high malignant potential, the mucin component, including the IPMNs and the mucinous cystic neoplasm. Now, in a multidisciplinary clinic, we don't see a lot of pseudocysts because they're more straightforward. So we tend to try to distinguish between serous and mucinous cystic neoplasm and often send these patients to EUS. And unfortunately, EUS works in about 50% of the time. And when it works, it can help you distinguish between mucinous cystic neoplasm, but looking at these fluid biomarkers and also genetic mutations, which I'll describe. But oftentimes, the results of the sample is inadequate. This is one example where it helped distinguishing between mucus plugs and mucinous secretions and a mural nodule. But oftentimes, the sample is inadequate. A lot of interest in developing these molecular biomarkers, and they improve sensitivity and specificity for detecting mucinous neoplasm, and can certainly help in reducing the number of unnecessary operations. So we're going to be hearing more about this in the near future. This is a study looking at 225 referrals to a single institution and these lesions were put in five categories, no, low, intermediate, high risk, and clear malignancy with four different management approaches, including surveillance, surgical resection, further evaluation, and discharge. And I want to highlight here the fact that in about a third of these patients, we changed the management completely, put the patient in a different category. What was disappointing is that even in a multidisciplinary clinic, eight patients who went to surgery were incorrectly classified. So this is just the nature of the difficulty, the challenges that we deal with. Okay, so what are the current guidelines? When you see that many guidelines, you know that we really don't know the right answer. And that's part of, this, that's part of the challenge. Starting with the 2006 Tanaka criteria that was modified in 2012, also in 2010, part of the incidental loma uh, criteria we'll touch upon uh, briefly. This was largely replaced recently by the American College of Radiology white paper that I'm going to uh, discuss as well. Uh, to add more complexity, in 2015, the American Gastroenterology Association came up with their own criteria. So basically, the uh, incidentaloma criteria looked at various lesion sizes, and a lesion less than two centimeter was followed up once uh, for one year and then stopped if it was stable. And if it is larger from two to three centimeter, you stop after two years. So gastroenterologists were a little concerned about that because certainly it wasn't long term enough to determine that leash lesions would remain stable and don't turn into a malignant adenocarcinoma. 
The Tanaka criteria was revised from 2006 back in 2012 and unfortunately went to another extreme where they identified suspicious features, but regardless of the size of the lesion, whether it's less than one centimeter or one to two centimeter or two to three centimeter, there was no end to follow up. If it's less than one centimeter, you get CTMR in two to three years, but they didn't specify when to stop. So it was very, very over utilization of imaging and EUS in many of these pancreatic uh, uh, patients with pancreatic cysts. Now, the 2015 American, uh, American Gastroenterology Association guidelines triggered some additional concerns because the suggestion was, regardless of the size, to stop surveillance at five years at five years. So even though this was okay with the radiologists, a lot of gastroenterologists were concerned because of the potential risk of developing adenocarcinoma in patients with pancreatic cysts. The concerns were that if the cyst is less than three centimeter without a solid component or a dilated pancreatic duct, that the surveillance is for five years, and if there's no change, you stop. So it argued against continued surveillance if there's no change for five years. The issues were that also there were a suggestion to, uh, against routine surveillance of cysts without high-grade dysplasia or malignancy at resection. Then we'll demonstrate that there is actually a risk of developing adenocarcinoma in such cases. Ironically, very close uh, within a few months of uh, the, these guidelines, two landmark papers in radiology by uh, Victoria Cherniak. The first one looked at the increase, reported increased mortality for patients younger than 65 with overall increased risk of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Also, Olga Brook reported that in spite of initial stability of cystic lesions at baseline, there were some of these cysts that grew over time beyond the one year period. So this triggered another um, white paper that is generated by the American College of Radiology, led by Alec Megabo and several uh, authors in this room today, uh, looking at what to do with these incidental lesions. And we took into consideration age, symptoms, size, imaging features, size of the pancreatic duct, growth, and multiplicity as well. We defined growth depending on different cyst size. We defined what would be considered concerning for a main duct. We defined the concerning features such as a mural nodule, wall thickening, dilated main duct, and these should trigger EUS. And the decision to stop follow-up was dependent on stability, but also comorbidities as well as patient's preference we recommended or suggested actually surgical consult for serous cyst above six centimeter. This is the suggested algorithm. These are only for adults and asymptomatic. If at any points there are symptoms, we should get surgical consult. All cysts are considered mucinous unless proven otherwise. Cyst side direct size directs the follow-up for the intervention. And at any time, if there are new features, we should get EUS. Cyst growth uh, should consider more frequent follow-up and EUS. What was highlighted but not in a table in the text, and I would urge you to look at it, is what to do with the white dot. So something that's T2 bright, less than five millimeters, we suggested one follow-up in two years, then stop. In fact, we put in this white paper that some may not even report it in patients 75 to 80 years of age. This is an example of the algorithm, and I'm not gonna go through it, but in general, we went to a 10-year follow-up period, depending on age at presentation, features at presentation, the frequency and the follow-up is for about 10 years for patients less than 80. This is just an algorithmic approach with various cyst size and how to follow them up, but the average was about 10 years. This is for larger type cysts. Again, stop follow-up after 
10 years. Now for patients 80 and older, the follow-up is for five years or if the patient is no longer a surgical candidate. So more recently, this is a recently uh, published article looking at the changes that happen for these cysts over an extended period of time. We followed over 600 cysts over a 50-month period, and we stratified them in two or more than two lesions, and we followed these cysts over an extended period of time and watched the changes based on the ACR stratification and guidelines. The septations were present in about a quarter of these lesions, Mural nodules were fairly rare, rightly, because if we see a mural nodule, we don't follow it up, we intervene. This is a summary of all the changes that occur. Most of the cysts remain stable. The change, the increase in size is in about the third of these lesions, usually the ones um, above five millimeters, five millimeters and above. What we reported here is that lesions that are less than five millimeters, the growth uh, was about 13% over extended period of time. What is important uh, is to realize that among all cysts less than five millimeters at baseline, 100% of these cysts were stable at three years and less than 6% increase in five years. So you can safely follow these lesions for um, three to five year period once and then you stop. Another recent change is this has just been released, the appropriateness criteria. What is pertinent to this talk is how to follow up these cysts. We followed the same concept of the white paper as far as the frequency, as far as the need for follow up, the average follow up, Again, we reported that based on limited experience, cysts that less than five millimeter may require one additional follow-up, whether it's two, three, or five years, but certainly one follow-up is adequate and then you can stop. So this is a quick overview of the MR imaging of the cysts. Definitely MR is an excellent modality for the detection and characterization. You need to recognize the specific features of each lesion. We know that the multidisciplinary approach is very useful and it often changes management. The role of molecular biomarkers is evolving and the indication and frequency of follow-up of small lesions remain controversial, but less than five millimeter, you can safely follow these up once, maybe two, three to five years, and then stop. The white paper and the ACR guidelines are available, and I urge you to look at them, and we'll be happy to answer any questions in the discussion later on. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>